All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the Autodesk Technology Center's Outsight panel. Today we're here to discuss our theme in extending automation and construction. My name is Sophia Zelov and I'll be your host today. At Autodesk, I work to cultivate relationships across industries and make connections through the Technology Center's Outsight Network, where we inspire teams to challenge the problems they face and find the new possible. The Technology Center's Outsight Network brings together pioneers in architecture, manufacturing, construction, design, and engineering from industry and academia. Over the past few years, we've, uh, we've supported over 450 teams from 350 different organizations from across 20 different countries. And we enable these teams to advance their skills, their strategy, and their business by providing them access to subject matter expertise state-of-the-art tools, and a diverse community. The challenge of the pandemic has accelerated our global reach beyond any one of our physical locations that are in San Francisco, Toronto, and Boston. And together, we are continuing to find new ways to design and make that will help us meet the demands of the future head on. Finding new, new ways to help teams deliver on this future, like with GHG Engineering, the technology centers, provide them with the access to people who can help them look at traditional pr business problems in a non-traditional way. To learn more about how to join the Technology Center's Outsight Network, check out our website or reach out to our team at technology.centers at autodesk.com. During today's discussion, you'll hear from a few of these teams about the, challenge, the challenges that they faced, the solutions that they built, and how they face the future of automation and construction. Today, we're here to talk about how tools can increase labor efficiency, reduce waste, and build faster, and how the tool creators and the tool users come together in the technology centers to advance our ways of making along the way. Before we dive into construction, we'll see a video on the collaboration between our panelists, and we'll each have a few slides to share on the work that they've done. Today, our panelists include Nick Kubre, CEO of Howick. Howick is a pioneer in the technology of precision light steel roll forming machines. Brandon Ayanata, Director of Sales and Marketing at Strucksoft. Strucksoft Solutions is a professional grade Revit framing software and Amr Rafat, Vice President and VDC and, te and Technology at Windover Construction. Windover has been a resident of the Technology Center since about 2019. And Stephanie Pender, our Senior Shop Supervisor at the Technology Centers. Stephanie provides support for teams in the Outsight Network, providing expertise in robotics, glass, and ceramics. And now I'll hand it over to our moderator, Danya El Hassan. Danya is the manager of AutoCAD Desktop Product Management, and prior to Autodesk, she held roles as a project manager or project engineer, superintendent, and VDC manager at Turner Construction in Boston. And afterwards, she transitioned to the software industry at AEC tech startups like Onshape and Fieldwire. All right, Danya, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Sophia. So today we, were, we want to hear from each of our panelists just a little bit about their background and how they came to be here um, at this panel and starting with Amr. Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Amr Rafat. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Virtual Design Construction at Udova Construction, leading our uh, VDC group uh, to uh, support our teams and our projects and clients to build the more efficient and safer, combining drone mapping, laser scanning, and automation. Uh, and we have been working with the Hawick Autodesk Technology Center and Stracksoft on uh, very creative solutions to help be more efficient and safer. And excited to share these new technologies with you today.
good now. So this is good, right? Awesome. So that was an overview about the example that we'll hear more from uh, our panelists today. It's amazing to see some of the work that they're doing from uh, pre-construction to installation and assembly, all really well thought out from beginning to end. So now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists, starting with Amr. Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll go through uh, what we've been working together. First, I'd like to give you a quick overview of uh, Wendover. Uh, we've been building academic buildings, uh, hospitality hotels, and life science projects, uh, custom homes, and different project types, a broad spectrum of services, construction management, and uh, design build projects, uh, uh, as you may see here, and sports facilities, academic buildings, uh, across uh, the US. Uh, what we did is that we've been utilizing different technologies, including 4D planning, digital prefabrication, laser scanning, CD printing, and drone surveys, and other leading edge technologies. Each of these technologies by itself is powerful, but when combined together, they can really offer real solutions to transform the way we build, to build safer, better, and faster. And that's what we've been doing at Windover. And, uh, uh, we decided to extend our services to all to other EEC industry uh, peers and groups, including architects and other construction companies to support them in the processes uh, in North America. And that's what we've been doing upon many requests from our, our peers and our partners. So right now we are working uh, on projects in California, Texas, Florida, Quebec, and New England area, of course, where we are based. Uh, we are trying to transform the way the industry is building, uh, combining all the different technologies. And one of the great examples of, of a project we've been working on it lately in, in partnership with uh, Howick and the collaboration with uh, Structsoft and uh, Autodesk Technology Centers, which we've been a residence at, is this uh, uh, historic building. It's a 120-year-old building 
uh, in uh, Beverly, Massachusetts, uh, an existing building that we are doing uh, fit out, uh, changing uh, all the programs inside. What we've been doing actually uh, using this tech first approach and the really great uh, technology, adaptive technologies that can adapt with any existing building from HOEC, uh, new technology here is that first, as we do in any project or of our existing building project, we laser scan it. And with that, we capture uh, an exact representation of how that building look. And what we found is that the different ceilings in the existing building has different heights. And that would require, we have lots of fit out for that building. So that's, we processed all the data in Autodesk Recap and we, as we've been using in Autodesk Civil 3D to see a spot elevation for all these uh, uh, ele uh, elevations. And then we found an Oh, that's a challenge. You have a, a, a historic building, existing building with so many different in heights. And then we learned about this great, uh, great uh, machinery work and great technology by Hoek. And we wanted to resolve these challenges using this new technology. So we've been utilizing Structsoft and Hoek at the Autodesk Technology Center in Boston to find ways to help adapt with uh, the with the building uh, playful heights in ceilings, as you may say. The power of this telescopics is that it's very easy to maneuver in the site. Uh, you, you don't need cranes to go in these very tight old elevators and uh, really tight corridors. The power, of, the power of this is that it gets assembled in the factory, which is a technology center in that case. And then it gets delivered. It can be compact in a very small packages and then it can spread back very adaptive to different widths and heights of corridors and windows, as you will see here. Our field team loved this technology. It's one of the things that can transform really the way we do quick fit outs in our buildings. They, they think it's very efficient, reduce time on site, which we really need now in the COVID world, uh, it help us maintain social distance. You don't need our teams to be on site all the time at the same time. It's uh, adaptive, as you may see here, with all the ceiling heights. So that's, a, I see that a very powerful uh, technology that can really transform with the way we do fit out. COVID-19 will go away, uh, I hope soon, and all the open space offices uh, concepts will probably, we need to revisit that to design, to refit our spaces and office spaces and public spaces. And with a technology like that, we can really pick out spaces very efficiently, very quickly, uh, with going around tight spaces and transform uh, uh, all these spaces very quickly and efficiently. So I see a great potential for this technology uh, to transform the way we build. Another collaboration we did with uh, Howick at the Technology Center is that building uh, at the YMCA in Gloucester, Massachusetts. We've been able to utilize the Howick technology as the Autodesk Technology Center to create almost a thousand trusts in only 15 hours. The waste, this helped us reduce the waste, there's almost no waste. We utilized the uh, Dynamo and the uh, Revit data we have for that building, for the trusses, transferred through Structsoft into fabricating, prefabricating all these trusses in 15 hours only. That's cutting time 70%, cost 70%. So we're cutting time and cost for our clients, as you see here, and then the great innovations is that could go in the technology center. We collaborated with a tech first approach with Fologram. Fologram is a, another fellow resident at the technology center. So we combined the prefabrication of power technology with the Fologram, as you see here. So we support our field teams to put the Microsoft HoloLens to be able to assemble those prefab trusses on site very quickly in three days instead of seven days. That's what you see in the hologram with the assembly. So it's basically like putting, uh, assembling all these trusses, guiding them in augmented reality without having to look outside of the task in hand, like assembling furniture. This is very efficient process, combining digital prefabrication with the hardware technology, track soft software, Autodesk technology, the technologies we have with the Revit data, we have the very information rich data we have in the Dymo and in the Revit. And then transfer that and utilizing a hologram to actually build, and uh, not only for visualization. I see the how technology is really transforming the way we build our modular projects. When Google has been a leader in modular construction, and we've been supporting different projects in the COVID times to build temple dorms very quickly. 
for few uh, many uh, academic uh, projects we see that how a technology can help us better plan for our projects for MEEP coordination as you see here it, it makes sure everything is, is fitting before fabrication um, so we are excited today to to uh, to hear from the Howick and Stracksoft and Autodesk teams about these great technologies, which we see is resolving a lot of issues, helping us build better, safer, uh, and faster. Thank you so much. Amazing, Amar. Uh, a lot has changed in the 10 years since I've been on the construction site. It's really great to see some of the progress you're making. Thank you. Um, next up, I'd like to hear from Brandon um, to talk us a little bit through his experience. Thank you, Danya and Amir. Um, so uh, before I get into this discussion, it's important to know a bit about uh, who we are at Strucksoft as a company and how we've arrived at this exciting crossroads of technology and manufacturing. Um, for those that don't know uh, who we are at Strucksoft Solutions, uh, we are a software developer servicing primarily the AEC industry, producing customized and commercial software for the light steel and wood framing industry. Um, we've had a very, very close ties to Autodesk since our inception as a company and being asked to work alongside the folks at the technology center has uh, really been an incredible experience. Uh, they've introduced, introduced us uh, to very forward thinking companies uh, like Windover Construction and helped us push our technology much further than we could have imagined. Um, now with Howick, we began a relationship nearly a decade ago, actually, and uh, their tech uh, has really been a perfect fit um, in this uh, ecosystem. Um, so our Metalwood Framer plugin has been helping companies leverage BIM data for construction, coordination, and manufacturing since uh, early 2008. Our first users were interior fit-out companies, primarily interested in uh, coordination and clash mitig mitigation. Uh, however, the demand quickly grew to support machinery um, to feed prefabrication. So the precision of Revit makes it a perfect vehicle for data-driven design and manufacturing. However, that precision has also been a hindrance, uh, especially when doing interior fit-out uh, of existing structures or historic buildings, uh, much like this particular project. Uh, it's an excellent example of that. Uh, so spatial constraints, irregularities add an additional layer of complexity and require higher degree of precision and coordination. Uh, and in this case, a lot of that was made much easier with how it ex uh, extend a stud technology. On the side of Strucksoft, um, the management of data of the data stream flowing to and from the construction process has been difficult to manage for many prefab companies. With multiple stakeholders in a project, fluid timelines and change orders, uh, we had to come up with a better system to manage the flow of data, such as manufacturing drawings and CNC code, more importantly. On this particular project, uh, we had information flowing from Amr's team um, in Boston to the Strucksoft offices in Montreal, then to New Zealand, uh, to the Howick team, and finally back to Boston at the, at the Technology Center to roll and assemble the material. So if we go back to the first slide for a second, um, we see a bit of a simplified overview of the workflow we've devised. Uh, first, the Revit model is framed out using our Revit plugin. And what's important to note is that we're using this specific and precise information from Revit um, in this model. Uh, it, of course, simplifies things like clash detection and change order management, reducing errors in the field. Uh, we then upload the project to our cloud production portal, Onyx. Onyx is where we house all the CNC data uh, that otherwise would clutter a Revit model and create slowdowns. Uh, it's also where all the stakeholders can log in and get a clear picture of the process of the manufacturing process. Uh, and next, we assign, we'll assign our panels a sequence number and begin organizing our panels and even the members within the panels into our manufacturing order. Uh, we can then visually assess all the important data and even graphically view and edit our wall panel uh, CNC operations, all from the cloud. So once we're happy with this, we output the CNC uh, files and download them straight to the Howard Roll Former. So that's really where the magic starts to happen and the panels start coming together. Uh, so it's obviously a very simplified um, overview. Uh, we're kind of glossing over some of the important aspects like change order management, versioning, tracking. Uh, but as an overview, this gives you a basic idea of what we're doing. So moving forward, 
Um, this is a, a shot uh, from our cloud-based CNC um, management tool, Onyx, and this is a complete frame model of uh, the Windover project. Um, here we can visually set the manufacturing or erection sequence or even both um, of each of our panels and we can get a vi visual as to, to where we are in the construction process. It's all accessible by all the stakeholders in a project anywhere in the world from any web enabled device. Uh, next up, we see the level at which we can organize our manufacturing job for efficiency. Uh, in steel manufacturing, we're dealing with large heavy coils of steel. The coils are ordered by size and gauge of steel. Changing them out cuts our productivity. So if I have a project using multiple gauges of material, then I can come into this view and I can organize my panels or even my members by gauge for more efficient manufacturing. Once they're output and rolled, we receive a status update and uh, we can notify the shop manager of the status. The next view is our CNC editor. Here we can make um, very minute modifications to the CNC code graphically, uh, as well as see how the code is impacted on the side-by-side -side view. This all happens live. Uh, this is completely kept out of the Revit model since it has no impact to the design of the project itself. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, seeing every single screw hole or punch out in a Revit model might start to get a little complicated. Uh, on the next slide, we have a great example of tracking a panel. This panel page, it can give us our unique barcode or QR code, uh, allowing us to uh, basically track the panel through the process. It also gives us some basic information, uh, dimensions, heights, weights, and so on. And uh, lastly, but most importantly in this process, um, we have a work order uh, view allowing us to see a detailed overview of our project's manufacturing process. Uh, we can see version history, new panels, uh, panels which have been rolled, as well as uh, panel information that has been downloaded um, and sent off to the Howick roll forming machine. So this technology allows us to bridge that gap between design and manufacturing and make this whole prefab process uh, possible and a lot easier. That's amazing, Brandon. Just the amount of detail that you have a handle on, uh, given your process, is really incredible. So thanks for sharing. Thank you. Um, next up, I'd like to hear from Nick to talk a little bit about the Howick machine. Hi, everyone. Um, so you've kind of seen the, how the project's evolved. But I wanted to go back and give a little history on Howick to start with, and then sort of talk you through how the process of developing this product has happened over the last sort of three to four years. Um, so Howick is based in New Zealand and we sell machinery all over the world into about 80 countries now. It's a third generation family business um, and while we're a relatively small business, I think we sort of punch above our weight on innovation. Um, so typically we make roll forming for steel framing. We've been doing that for the last 25 or so years and we've seen the industry change from a very simple process to quite complex stuff and then led to the telescopic system which you see now that solves a whole lot of the problems. So we started with this great accuracy and that created its own problems. Um, also going back a long way, the, the software's changed a lot. So, so the, the, about four years ago, we put our first standard machine into the technology center in Boston, um, which was an interesting experience for us, something we'd never done before. And we get to work with all these great companies like the Windovers and the Structops office and everybody that's trying to develop anything. So, if we just see on the next slide, one of the first projects we did when the machine arrived in Boston was the fit out of the third floor. Um, so this was something we'd always talked about, how do we do internal framing better? Because mainly we're doing structural. So our accuracy of plus or minus 32nd of an inch allowed us to be super accurate and everything fit together nicely. The problem is you get into an old building, especially like the building in Boston, which is sort of 100 odd years old. I think there was a five inch deviation in the floor height across this floor. Um, so we worked with one of the residents there. We did a full scan of the building. All the MEP design was done by another contractor there as well um, and was installed by a different contractor again, working with Struxoft to develop the frames. And we kind of knew the problem was there, but there's all these deviations and how do we fix them and how do we make it fit together nicely? So that floor, we ran all the panels in about eight hours, assembled them, and then the crew came through and installed them all in one head after that. Um, so worked really well, but the time consuming bit was actually designing the panels. You either go super accurate and spend a lot of time on design 
or you allow some tolerances and then you've got to fill in all the gaps. So it worked well, but it's kind of, it was a step ahead of traditional, but it wasn't a great leap. So if we jump to the next slide now, you can see that the, this is where the extender system came from. So the initial sort of drive from this was that project plus a couple of customers asking for the same thing. They wanted a telescopic stud that they could fit into a traditional system. And we sort of stood back and looked at that and thought, well, that's great, that's simple. How about we integrate it into one of our standard machines? Um, so first of all, they wanted just sort of two to three inches of telescoping to work with the deflection of the floors of the buildings they were building. Um, we soon found when we got on site that if we could extend the process and compress the panels a lot more, it makes more sense for transport and moving things around. So we ended up with panels that were sort of 16 foot high that were compressing down to a seven foot high um, for one of the projects we did on a shopping center, which was one of the first projects we actually ran. Um, and that, so we pulled, I think three weeks out of the timeline on that project. So that was a huge difference to the customer. It was a first runoff project and we intended to do maybe half a dozen panels on this project. We ended up doing the whole floor. Um, so it just sort of shows the concept of what's happening. Um, but it all ties back to how do we model the building? How do we actually design them to fit? And you know, there are other advantages as well around the space if we can actually pre-design all these panels. Um, one great example we found with one customer we're working with was that approximately 90% of the panels could be standardized and kind of built for the same building. Um, and then the last 10% could be designed up at a later date once they knew the exact measurements. Um, so it just allows them to pipeline stuff and forward think things where previously we'd have to be wait for the finished site and then go and site measure. So that kind of brings us back around to this project um, and sort of seeing what we can do. So I'll hand back and then we can get through some questions. Yeah, amazing. I like how you're describing this tension between um, sort of accuracy and precision and this adaptability of the environment to the real world. That's a, a major challenge for, for all of you that you've overcome. So, so that actually brings me to my first question, which is what are the challenges and problems that you're seeing in the industry? And maybe you can talk a little bit about what you're doing to address them at your own companies. Oh, I'm sorry, one second. Um, let me back up just a minute. We have one more person that I'd like to introduce before we get into questions. Um, and that is Stephanie. Hi, I thought I was off the hook for a second. <laughs> no, you are not, sorry. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Stephanie Pender, Senior Shop Supervisor at the Autodesk Technology Center in Boston. There I support residents such as Amir and Wendover from the Outsight Network on a range of projects. The Autodesk Technology Center is a research and development workspace where Autodesk invites startups, academia, and industry experts to explore ways to advance the building industry. The center focuses on industrialized construction, visual fabrication, automation, and robotics and construction, and other ideas that are transforming the built world. I provide training and support on a range of equipment that enables teams to experiment and explore new design and make workflows that otherwise would have been inaccessible. In addition, we provide a vast network and access to a wide range of specialists and subject matter experts in various fields. For my presentation, I will feature two different members of our outside network that are working on innovative industrialized construction workflows. Next slide, please. First is Apis Core, a construction startup focused on developing hardware and processes around additive manufacturing with concrete. They joined our outside network to fabricate hardware and to refine process parameters for their systems. They recently 3D printed wall structures of a two-story administrative building in Dubai for Dubai municipality. This building stands at 9.5 meters tall with an area of 640 square meters. It is the largest 3D printed building to date. Next slide, please. Through the outside network, Apis Core connected with Thornton Tomasetti, a structural engineer. Since there is no single standard of 3D printed structures that can be approved for residential construction that complies with international building codes and construction requirements, they needed to provide data that their 3D printed product is as structural as a concrete masonry unit. With Thornton Tomasetti, Apis Core conducted testing that produced a report 
that approved their 3D printed product for residential construction. And now they're currently working on affordable housing initiatives in Louisiana and California. The next project I will introduce is the Arroyo Bridge. This project began at the University of Southern California School of Architecture and developed into a design build research initiative focusing on the future of collaborative robotics, metrology and logistics in large scale permanent construction. The project is a prefabricated 80 foot asymmetrical pedestrian bridge designed and permitted for permanent installation in California. This is the Redshift video and article that came out a couple months ago. The bridge is comprised of tubular HSS members, each connected with a customized gusset plate or fish mouth connector. The bridge, which is over 600 unique parts, was divided into 30 nodes for prefabrication. Next slide, please. They utilize one of our facility's robotic arms to act as a precision welding positioner and metrology device. We developed custom tooling and custom software solutions with internal Autodesk teams and other tech center residents. The team tack welded parts and bracing with robotic precision to assist state coded, state code certified human welders for final assembly in California. After they produced the nodes in Boston, the, the 30 nodes were shipped across the country where they were fabricated into the bridge. Because of the custom workholding and metrology processes that were integrated into the workflow, the bridge assembled within tight tolerances. Next slide, please. I'll close again with an invitation to join us within our outside network to reimagine what is possible with your design and make processes. Please reach out if you're interested. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, it, it, it's a good reminder that some of the challenges in doing these innovations really go beyond technology. Things like network and collaboration really help dealing with codes and standards. Um, there are a lot of challenges that the Technology Center can help with. So really interesting perspective. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, with that, I do want to talk about some of the challenges you each are seeing. Um, and and uh, I'd like to start with Amr. So can you talk a little bit about, about some of those challenges and problems that you've overcome um, in your journey here? So aside, the, that's a great point. So aside of, uh, of the typical challenges with, which is a shortage of material or really skilled labor, uh, I think that the challenge that's facing our industry is right now for many of our many of the industry uh, peers thinking of technology as more of tool based and not solution based. We uh, consider laser scanning as tools, drones are tools, but not really as a solution based. So communication with the field teams is really essential and helped us at Wendover to really listen to the field teams, see what the challenges on site is, and utilize all these leading edge technologies, whether it's laser scan, drone mapping, or digital prefabrication with the HOWIC technology and the Autodesk uh, modeling and the data uh, capture, so we can offer real solutions. So in order for us to uh, advance our industry, overcome any challenge, actually, we got to talk about real solutions for real projects. Another thing is communication. communication within the, uh, in the, the project stakeholders. It's very important and uh, I see that it, it's time has passed now. No one should be working in silos, like uh, field teams or project managers or estimators. All of us should collaborate. And I think platforms like Autodesk Build and uh, the BEM and the VDC technologies can really bring all these uh, these project teams together to really offer real solutions. And the last thing that I think is uh, facing our uh, industry is culture of innovation and flexibility and the mindset that could allow us to really think out of the box, find the solutions, to, willing to try new technologies such as this adaptive, amazing telescopic studs and the project managers and the great supers who are willing to try this technology and uh, to build safer and more efficient. Awesome. Yeah, Brandon, you started to talk a little bit about some of the challenges you're seeing as well. Do you want to elaborate? Absolutely. Um, on the software side of things, you think we wouldn't get involved too much on the actual uh, making uh, of things uh, as such. 
Um, but we do, and we see a lot of problems. I think Amir really hit the nail on the head there with communication. Communi communication is a big one. Uh, we've been kind of all um, getting accustomed to working in this uh, collaborative uh, sandbox uh, that is uh, BIM uh, for a while now. And as we are moving further and further towards um, industrialized manu uh, construction, excuse me, manufacturing, prefabrication, um, we've kind of left that side of things out of it a bit. So to be able to have the overview and the control um, of uh, stakeholders, seeing what's going on in the manufacturing process right out to final delivery and erection of uh, our projects uh, is uh, massive. Um, also, there's still a bit of a technology gap on that manufacturing side, not so much in the machinery that they're being used, but in the software uh, that they're being used. Uh, Autodesk has really helped that along uh, with a lot of their cloud solutions. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of companies like ours in different industries that are trying to do the same. You know, we have uh, we have to see projects as, a, as, a, as an ecosystem, and it's important that every part of that ecosystem uh, remains linked at all times, not just when, you know, the, the, the walls are going in or when the MEP is going in. Uh, it, it's, it's a constant battle to keep that communication uh, up. And uh, I see that as probably one of the biggest challenges um, we face right now uh, in the construction industry, especially as it pertains to, uh, to manufacturing. Awesome. Yeah, you, and you talked a little bit about how that gets, um, you know, exacerbated by the global uh, nature of our work that's even more so today. Absolutely. Than You're talking time zones and, uh, you know, people in different countries. Sometimes we're talking uh, units of measure, metric versus <laughs> imperial. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of translation involved in all this. Yeah. Good thing you have a handle on that data. Um, how about you, Nick? Would you like to share a little bit about your perspective? Yeah, um, Amir and Brandon kind of laid it out pretty much is exactly what the problem is. It's all about productivity. Um, where we have an automation tool, without everything else, it's nothing. Um, and we see quite a lot in the industry, I think, I'm going to buy this tool and that's going to solve all my problems. But part of buying that tool and using that tool is actually sort of preloading the project as such. Um, we always sort of think if you put 30% of effort, more effort into the design, you're probably going to pull 50% out of the actual on-site construction. Um, and it's not just our bit, like we make these accurate frames, but the accurate frames then allow you to do accurate installation and cladding and windows and fit outs. A good example is like kitchen benches. We've got one customer here in New Zealand who can pre-order all his granite and stone bench tops, knowing they're going to fit exactly because the model's right. And it's kind of a flow on effect. If you were traditionally building and you've got guys on site working off paper drawings and tape measures, it's never going to work. And that's where the industry, I think, is going to have to go to get the productivity we need with the fewer people that we have that are skilled. Um, that's where it's got to go. So I think Autodesk and Structsoft and, and people like Window, they play have a huge part to play in actually driving that through. And people will have to adapt to it to sort of keep up with the market eventually. Mm -hmm. Great, amazing. Stephanie, would you like to add to that a little bit on, on kind of the communication piece, I think is one of uh, the pieces that you talked a little bit about in your, um, in your discussion about how the technology centers work. Can you talk a little bit about your perspective on, on what's changed uh, on this project or in general um, to address some of the challenges that our teams are seeing? I think, you know, one major issue I've seen not only in construction, but now with COVID-19 is, you know, the breakdown of supply chain management. And I, I think firsthand what was so incredible watching people work firsthand with the Howick machine is how it's it's essentially just a giant spool of material that comes on site. It's very easy to move around. It's not like you have all these steel studs that you have to measure and cut apart. Um, and then just the flexibility for being able to easily kind of, you know, cut what you need and and what was so shocking was the, the huge reduction of waste um, there's very little waste after the process and with construction waste accounting for 40 percent of of waste production it's um it's huge that that we can cut down waste in, in that way and enhance labor efficiency um so you know just as far as the efficiency with labor the um you know, just being able to minimize the kind of amount of materials on site 
or the, the shipment of material has been huge as far as uh, our firsthand experience with it. Amazing, great. Um, so I do, I wanna talk a little bit about the innovations that each of you have made in your own businesses that actually, that show some of the examples of the progress you've made towards addressing those challenges. Um, what have you been seeing? Like, what have you been able to accomplish now today that really shows our progress in this direction? So, uh, to, to, uh, I like a lot when Stephanie mentioned earlier in her presentation about uh, redefining the possibilities of how we build. Uh, uh, recent examples of projects we've been working on, another historic building in the North Shore of Boston, where we utilize the 3D printing directly from Revit data to 3D print uh, historic facade elements uh, at the tech center. We produce the 3D, uh, use the 3D printing to actually replicate historic facade elements and build them. So now when you drive by, you did all these 3D printing facade elements using 3D printing. That's another way to redefine the possibility of how we can build uh, using, uh, using the BIM data. It's about really not how you capture the data from the laser scan, it's what you're going to do with this data. Another possibility is the work we've been doing, utilizing drone mapping and laser scanning uh, during the COVID surge, for example. So there are project managers who've been working remotely and the others who've been uh, working on site to maintain social distance and how regular QA, QC overlays and laser scans help with streamline decision-making and enhance communication. We also uh, collaborated with a robotic software company uh, at the tech center to develop a robot that can do autonomous laser scan and layout. So there are different possibilities of how we can utilize different technologies to improve efficiencies, uh, but we have to really combine all these different technologies together and not look at it as tools, but rather solutions. Uh, and that's what we've been helping us a lot uh, being able to find the real solutions on real projects. And the key here is to try these new leading edge technologies as a HOIC technology with a telescopic today we're talking about in a real project with real uh, schedule and see the great impact and cost savings it can provide to our clients. And that's how we can really advance the industry forward. Uh, construction companies can work for a very long time in silos. We want to get anywhere. The only way we can advance our industry is to collaborate with manufacturers, uh, forward-thinking manufacturers like Howick, great uh, software developers like uh, Stracksoft, and great visionary uh, 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 technology uh, like Autodesk. So the way we, the more we work together, uh, as a hologram, for example, the mixed reality thing. So uh, the more we can really work it together, the more we can advance the industry forward. Yeah, awesome. Um, anything you'd like to add to that? I think there might be a, a data piece there in the in the examples of innovation. Brandon, you look like you want to say something to that nature. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I definitely think that um, at Structsoft, we're, we're very proud of a lot of firsts, uh, you know, as far as our Revit app is concerned, uh, outputting, um, you know, CNC data from Revit. Uh, you know, we've really had a, a lot of uh, very close collaboration with um, Autodesk, which has allowed us to kind of um, be part of a lot of these firsts, uh, which is uh, fantastic. Um, I, I think the thing that um, we're probably most proud of, though, is being uh, part of this journey with uh, Autodesk, Howick, and a lot of our clients who have kind of taken this further, you know, companies like Windover who are bringing in um, other technologies like um, laser scanning, hollow lenses, um, things like this and, and, and applying them in the day to day. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, as part of my role, I get involved in a lot of meetings and there's a lot of ideas that get produced from these meetings. Um, but to be part of it uh, with, um, you know, the technology center, with Windover, with Howick and see these get employed uh, for real, day in, day out, uh, it's it's uh, it's an exciting thing. So uh, you know that's it's really what I think is 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 most important here that we're achieving. Awesome. How about you, Nick? I think the the um, the innovations you've made are pretty apparent. Um, but would you like to add anything to to that? It's sort of the process that um, like Amar and Brandon again touched on. 
is, is that communication. So if you look at us, we're sort of two or three steps removed from the construction process. So because we're not actually a construction company ourselves, we're an engineering company, we will, to things like the telescopic have come from listening to somewhere like a, a mayor and Windover saying that this is our problem, N not coming to us with, oh, I think this is the solution, but this is our problem. And I think that collaboration is really good because we can come up with some really off the wall ideas that are outside the construction industry, they may come from the car industry or something along those lines, that we can then roll into the construction industry. It all helps that automation and that collaboration. But without the communication we get from people that are really willing to communicate and share their problems and their ideas, it just would stop. I, mean, I think that's always been a problem with the industry. It doesn't move forward. People don't collaborate as they should. Mm. Um, and BIM is driving that a bit because now there's so much information in the model, you can actually see not only your problems, but everybody else's. Yeah, I'd love to dig a little bit deeper on that, actually, um, and talk a little bit about how how you've seen your organizations transform to meet some of these challenges. You all sort of touched upon it a little bit there, um, but I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you're seeing um, internally in your organizations that help you meet the challenges of today. Stephanie, would you like to, to talk? Yeah, I, I kind of wanted, I can tie this in with this new question, but um, the, the data piece, I think, um, and Brandon's presentation actually made me kind of think about this too, that a lot of teams I see coming, doing industrialized construction are using manufacturing workflows, they're using manufacturing software. And what I'm seeing is a scale issue as far as the software is only able to accommodate so much data at a certain scale and often building scales are kind of overloading those systems. So I think, you know, Brandon's presentation where he was showing the kind of, you know, the, the model, but also this ability to kind of like pull data, but not always having the data there kind of cre creating latency, um, I think is huge. Um, Cause that's something I'm seeing over and over again is that there's just too much data. Um, with these kinds of design to make workflows. Um, so, so that's, that's huge. And, and I think that's something that we're seeing a lot revealed by teams who are coming, trying to use this manufacturing workflows, trying to focus more on prefabrication. Um, and, and the current workflow, the current BIM systems just aren't embedding that kind of construction information modeling they're needing that, that brand is just demonstrating that, you know, that they can capture. Yeah, if you don't mind, Dania, it, it actually this uh, segues perfectly into into your question about the innovation that that you know we're we're kind of seeing to to kind of bridge these gaps, um, and uh, it is that data that um, is driving that innovation, at least on our part, and I think with Amr and Nick as well. Um, the data that's currently available or needed rather for manufacturing. Um, uh, sorry a good manufacturing process is extremely heavy on uh, the technology that we're employing today and part of the the huge innovation that we've been working on the last couple of years is kind of extracting that very minute form of data from the revit model it is not necessary to see screws and uh, you know small minute holes for those screws in the model it's necessary for the manufacturing process though. Uh, it's necessary for the um, ordering process if we're ordering screws or we're ordering steel. Um, so that is the data that we want to um, extract from the model at an early stage. And what we've been pushing now is actually pushing this to the cloud. Um, that's kind of the big innovation that we've been working on is pushing this into a cloud, into a collaborative workspace uh, sandbox, which can be accessed by anybody. One of the other problems is, is skill level. Now, I'm not even going to get started on the skill level in uh, on the field. That's a that's another topic I think Amr could probably help us with. Um, but as far as the technology is concerned, you know, um, a Revit technician uh, requires very, 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 um, you know, a special set of skills. Whereas a manufacturer who's running a uh, manufacturing facility doesn't need those Revit skills, he needs another set of skills, but he does have to access the same set of data. So to ask them to, um, you know, learn Revit for, for, the, for the purpose of manufacturing is, uh, is a bit of a leap. So being able to pull it out of Revit into um, a much more uh, 
easily absorbed workspace like um, uh, you know a cloud piece um, is uh, helping us advance this technology and push it into more companies. Um, you know, when you tell someone that the guy on the re on the on the shop floor needs uh, to you know basically have a degree in Revit, they look at you like uh, that's never going to happen. But when I say he can open his browser and he can access the you know millimeter precise data that he needs to roll and to uh, construct that wall panel, uh, they take a second look and they look at you a bit more seriously. Amazing. Yeah, it sounds like just the level of detail that you have is different for different people and different needs. And so you're able to help kind of bridge the gap between um, you know, the amount of richness that you have and the, just delivering the right data at the right time for the right person. Right. So that, that's pretty incredible. Um, let's move back to, let's go with Nick next. Would you like to talk a little about um, kind of the transformation of, of your own in, um, organization and, and talk a little bit more about that piece of it? it, it it's very much driven by a pull from the customers, um, for the end, the end customer. The, um, when we started, the panelization was really simple. So it was all 2D and it was a whole lot of extra work. And the whole BIM model piece has made such a difference now. Um, and what Brandon's working on makes it easy. And as he sort of alluded to that, most of our users are not necessarily Revit or Struxsoft users, um, but they've got to work together. And I think one of the thoughts around that is with BIM and everything that's going on is that it's the ownership of the model is going to be the next big thing. Who owns that model? Rather than having 10 different contractors with 10 different models, the main contractor has the model and gives everybody access to it. And that's going to be quite a big step change to the industry because at the moment, everybody owns their own model and no one wants to share. And that, I think, is the next big step in the innovation is if the model's super accurate, everything else can be super accurate. And if you know, the HVAC guy makes a change, everybody knows about it. And and vice versa. So that's, I think, where our next step of innovation is coming. The machines themselves and the framing is, it will evolve, but I don't think there's going to be any massive change to the actual structure of what it is. It's just about how it's going to work and where we're going to feed that information from our ends. The next thing I see is the automation of the assembly of the frames. And everybody's looking to that at the moment. It's not actually that easy because there's so much data, there's so much information you have to know and so many layers. Um, but that will come and I think the cloud will drive it because of the processing power and the fact that you can get the experts in each little bit to work together. Incredible. That's so great. Um, yeah, I, I would like to see if, if Amory, you have anything to add to that. It's, it's so interesting to see from each of your perspectives because you have such a different lens on the same um, process. Um, so I, I am I'm curious to hear from Amory as well about um, Kind of the flip side of what Nick is talking about. So, so uh, actually, Brandon and Nick and Stephanie hit on a very, very important topics. And uh, at Wendover, we've been trying to unify manufacturing with BEM data, uh, so we can reduce, make anything basically. As I always say, and it's very amazing that we have developed. Uh, we at Wendover, we learn new software and new technology almost every six months. So it requires from a BDC teams uh, some sort of dedication to learn, constantly learn new technologies and embed them into the BIM workflow. Another aspect is uh, computer power. Like I update, we update our laptops every almost a year uh, with new, very powerful computers. So we can keep up with uh, big files of 3D Studio Max or Fusion so computer power also uh, needs to cope with the big data we capture uh, from our big files from laser scans and drone mapping and manufacturing 3D models. That's all computer power, dedication to learn new things all the time. Uh, I think that's how we can transform. In terms of culture and uh, to your point earlier, uh, it's it's been it really depends on the culture that can embrace new ideas. When you go talk to, to our superintendents and project managers about challenges and how we can resolve them, it's about flexibility and thinking, a mindset that can open for new technologies to try on the projects and offer real solutions. I like Brandon's point about time zones. It's amazing that we are 
we, uh, like in the Gloucester job, uh, we were uh, collaborating with a um, uh, phonogram in Australia, uh, Howick, New Zealand, on a project uh, in Boston. It's amazing how right now this data and the fast transfer of data and knowledge can really uh, enhance collaboration and support the projects in anywhere, anytime. And that's amazing. And I see that Autodesk is playing a big role on that, on bringing all this network of innovators around the world so we can really uh, advance the industry and offer solutions on real projects. Great. Stephanie, anything to add to that part? Yeah, I think, you know, just bring into the, the accessibility that um, Amir was kind of talking about that I think the tech center is, is not only about the kind of established customer, but we're also about the startup um, and the, the university. And, you know, I think the, the, ups, the uh, upscaling, upscaling is huge that, that we are definitely always testing new ways to train, uh, new kind of pedagogies to get people up and running on a lot of this equipment. Amir has gone through a lot of our training. Um, but also I think we, we kind of have these real world examples out there, not just kind of existing in like the hermetic sealed space of the lab or of the technology center, but there's like Amir's, you know, taking these kinds of real world examples incrementally in the meeting. It's not like this huge kind of takeover, but it's very incremental. Um, Howick did another fantastic project with the Center for Design Research at Virginia Tech with Howick with Strucksoft. Um, where they were building medical clinics um, in Zambia, Uganda, um, very quickly, um, and working with nonprofits. So, you know, that kind of accessibility might not be available if there wasn't the network, um, if we weren't able to kind of make these connections. So, um, I, I think that's a huge part because it's not just, you know, the, the kind of huge projects, um, but also showing these incredible projects in developing worlds with affordable housing, clinics, schools, things like that. Amazing. Yeah, I'd like to come back to that a little bit uh, when we talk more about the technology centers okay. in a minute. Um, but before we get to that, I'm really interested in, in understanding why now. You know, we've been talking about pre-construction and data and cloud and the transformation that, that some of you have been talking about today for some time now. Um, and I know you have all been working at it for a while. What do you see today that's going to drive the larger scale adoption um, to take place in this industry? Even, even before uh, COVID, um, uh, we've been investing in these different technologies, including laser scanning, drone mapping, digital prefab. Um, I see right, that COVID-19 crisis has, has emphasized on the need that we work uh, and digital workflows. Uh, I see that, uh, like building, we built uh, temp dorms, modular projects for academic buildings who need in one month only, or month and a half, uh, temp dorms done in modular for academic projects. So when so schools, uh, students can go back safe to school in September. So you have a condensed schedule. And the only way you can do that is digital prefab, modular, expedite processes. So I think that's part of why now, but also uh, it's now that we have com computer powers, we have the vision more, we have dedicated uh, innovators who can really look, look into uh, solutions and build better and safer. And the part of that, of course, is that online network collaboration between uh, different entities in uh, on the cloud, uh, per brand, as Brandon mentioned, so that ease of a transfer of knowledge and the communication right now is on, I think it's, it's at its peak and we got to embrace that to move forward. Yeah, um, I, this is actually something I've talked a lot about uh, during uh, my career with Strucksoft and uh, I think there's a, a lot of different factors that influence uh, construction as a whole uh, to move this way now. Um, you know, and some of it is geographic. If we look at what companies in uh, Scandinavia, for instance, are doing uh, as far as prefabrication, uh, believe it or not, they're probably the most advanced uh, companies out there um, for construction prefabrication uh, in the world. And their main uh, 
you know, driver is obviously the reduced building season uh, because uh, winter is tough. Um, but um, here in North America, we're, we're, you know, we don't see a reduced building season everywhere. We're, we're facing a, a different uh, problem, which is um, skilled labor shortage. Um, for one, uh, second, uh, there is a uh, housing shortage for two. Uh, so that's causing, uh, you know, um, a brush to produce uh, new buildings um, with fewer and fewer people that are capable of doing it. Um, on top of that, uh, what is also driving that is definitely the technology, as Amir mentioned, is, and as Nick mentioned, you know, the technology that's, that uh, Nick, uh, Nick's company produces um, in some part has been available for, I think, uh, 20 years, Nick? Yeah, about, about 25. 25, there. So it's been around for a long time, but I think, um, you know, the software industry hasn't done a great job uh, up until recently of, of supporting that, especially for, for excuse me. Brandon, um, we missed the last sentence you just had there. Sorry, guys, I think you lost me for a second. Yep, I hear you now. Sorry, guys, did you, did you, am I? You're cutting out just a little bit. Brent, is it all right if we come back to you in a minute? Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. Um, Nick, do you want to elaborate on that? I know you guys have been kind of at it a, a long time, and I'm interested in, in your perspective as well. Yeah, well, as I kind of alluded to before, when we first started, the software well, it wasn't really up to much. It was all 2D. It was very manual. It was quite time consuming. Um, and you had to really know what you were trying to achieve. You were doing panel by panel rather than whole building. And I think that's one of the big drivers. Um, the other thing is obviously the cost of construction. So the cost of people on site is getting bigger and bigger by the day. But what we found was construction companies were not really willing to do that upfront design. They didn't have a design team. They were used to getting, a, if they were lucky, a PDF drawing and then converting what they had to do to make it happen. We're now the, the next driver has been BIM. So um, we do a lot in the UK and what we've seen there is the, the legislation around um, government buildings and public buildings having to have full BIM models. All of a sudden got that model. So that step from taking the model to producing a CNC file for the machine is actually quite small. It's, it's already there, most of the data. So something that was a massive blocker has now been removed and it's quite easy. Um, and they're starting to invest because they have to have a team running BIM to use one of those people then to actually do the framing design, which is relatively easy in the big scheme of things, has changed it. And I think that's going to happen more and more, um, especially now with, if you look at the average age of someone on site in the construction industry is getting older and older, and there's not very many young apprentices and new construction teams coming through. So the, the whole system is changing. Uh, I don't think it's going to go totally volumetric and totally offsite, but, and there is going to be some sort of hybrid construction coming, um, but it's a matter of making that easy and making it all pull together. And I think that's the real key to it. And the, the BIM and what Autodesk is doing with all its cloud software is mm. going to drive that hugely. Interesting. Yeah, I think a, a theme I'm starting to see from, from all of you is, you know, kind of two things happening, this removing of barriers that's happening with technology and cloud capabilities and some of the innovations you each are making, but also the fact that these constraints are actually driving innovation, you know, whether it be COVID or the weather in Scandinavia or um, labor shortages, these, these constraints are actually driving you to innovate and that I find that very interesting it, it seems like now really is the time um, as these confluence of factors are creating that that perfect ecosystem for um, innovation um, Stephanie is there anything that you want to add to that part um I think I mean I think you you were just so articulate for so as far I mean I think that it was it was huge the, the main point the main takeaway I think you made was how constraints and challenges are driving innovation so you know rather than saying like we can't do that because you you embrace that and you this is a common problem like this this is something we're seeing over and over again this is a trend 
like let's address this. Um, and I think that the data part is huge that we've already hit. I think you know the other issue of is is upskilling of is that like of thinking about ways to communicate across um, all of these extremely specialized kind of disciplines. So I think it was hit like you know often we're trying to learn Revit, you know, the fabrication people are trying to learn Revit and like, you you know, what are ways that we can kind of like teach that or train it or um, kind of create a, a streamlined workflow to just get what you need out of something in order to fabricate. So I think all of the challenges that we are kind of revealing here are actually drivers for better ways of working. Yeah. And we're seeing it in the AutoCAD customer base as well, um, you know, driving towards using the web and mobile technologies and a lot of the, the cloud solutions we're offering as well. So it's across the board. I'm seeing I'm seeing similar things in, a, in the broad Autodesk customer base. Um, super interesting. So I, I, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the technology center itself um, and, and talk a little bit about the mission, Stephanie, if you will uh, kind of start us out. Talk about the mission of the technology center. Um, and why, you know, why it exists and, and why we have this great panel of, of uh, contributors today. Yeah, the technology centers, I'll start with their mission. It's to catalyze new possibilities for making across Autodesk, across industries, and with our customers. And I, th you know, we are a software company that's very invested in design, but as we know, these things don't exist in a hermetically sealed bubble. A lot of these things need to be fabricated. So we need to be deeply invested in that process as well. So the, the technology centers were originally a place to kind of, we could go and we could have all sorts of teams have this kind of radically open innovation where everyone can participate together. Um, through the past couple of years, what we have discovered that we are really good at is connecting disparate industries, different people, different places of the world. And I think that's the kind of value we, we are seeing that we're, we're adding um, in, in the most kind of impactful way. And I think that this panel is, is an excellent example of, of that. I think, you know, Amir's touched on Fologram, um, these other kinds of uh, cross global collaborations that are happening. So. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's just a, a place to explore and experiment together, um, but not only on kind of research and development projects that exist in a lab, but that are actually out in the world. Great. Yeah. So, and just, you know, to hear the flip side, um, quickly, I, I know we want to go to questions very soon, but just from the three of you, can you talk a little bit about how the tech centers have supported you and your business, um, in your transformations? Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll go first. Sorry about before I get so passionate talking about this stuff, I uh, knocked <laughs> over my tablet. <laughs> um, but uh, I think that um, the Technology Center is, is fantastic um, to get the word about this out there. Um, it's the one place I could think of where any company can go and can look at these technologies being employed uh, day in, day out. You know, previously, uh, let's be honest, companies out there are looking for their competitive edge. And uh, this is this type of construction is absolutely a competitive edge. Um, but how many companies are going to share with their competitor, uh, you know, what they're doing better, um, which is an okay thing. Um, but here with Autodesk, we're able to uh, walk in, we're able to take a look at, at these technologies that are able to give our companies a competitive edge in manufacturing, uh, in, in technology employment, uh, in uh, product, you know, project management. Uh, so I, I think for that alone, you know, just being able to see how these things can, can change your day to day uh, in a, uh, you know, in a collaborative environment is uh, fantastic. Let's go to Amr. One of my favorite uh, uh, bi-weekly events is uh, something called Idea Exchange, which is a really great uh, time where residents exchange ideas. And uh, I've been a user uh, of uh, Autodesk uh, technology for more than 22 years, 23 years. And uh, I, I, I love the idea of 
unifying what we, the data we have in our 3D models to make things. And that a, was a good place that we collaborate and uh, find new ways to work with robotics software company, with a mixed reality uh, com uh, software company, with folks like Stratsoft and uh, Howick uh, Technologies, which is, uh, we, we are launching, we're talking today about an amazing telescopic new technology that could really help with historic buildings and fit out very quickly to increase efficiency. So I think the technology center is is a was great and instrumental for us to to meet this because the only way really we can advance our uh, industry which really needs uh, to be advanced to be more efficient is really that we work with cross uh, different industries uh, not only as uh, architects or EEC firms but also to work together and collaborate with uh, Howick for example which is amazing to unify manufacturing with BIM data, which we do on a daily basis as VDC teams, with the help of what translates between these two, like Stratsoft, in an environment that's very creative, like the technology center. Uh, I think it's it's been amazing, and also the the geographical aspect to it, uh, collaborating with uh, companies around the world. So we can work together on advanced projects and help the projects uh, along the North America and beyond. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to shift to questions from the audience and participants. Um, we had a few that already have come in. So if, um, if there are more, please submit them. Um, I will be reading out a few of them here. So one of the questions is, I think, more for Nick and Brandon. And the question is about how does structural engineering um, to, to engineer the gauges and the connections um, really work in the Structsoft and Howick system? Um, is it a separate process? Is it automated into the software? How do you deal with structural engineering of the parts? Um, so there's a, a number of ways that gets done. We've actually made a lot of um, efforts and uh, inroads into developing um, engineering software and analysis into uh, what we do. Um, for the North American market, we've primarily done a lot. Uh, we have our own finite element analysis engine. That's a mouthful um, for trust, like H steel truss design. Um, you know, a big part of like H steel construction um, are actually trusses. They go together very nicely. Uh, they are very strong. I think Amir did uh, quite a few on a, on another project, um, and uh, they're they're quite easy to erect comparatively to uh, you know um, heavy steel or wood. Um, so that being said, uh, we saw an in there um, and uh, created a software to that effect that will do exactly that. It'll size the members, uh, select the gauge, and um, you know set those connections for you. Uh, for other parts of the uh, construction project, for instance, the floors, again, we're able to do uh, similar things. I know Nick's company offers um, you know a floor system um, that's available uh, to roll floor members or you can use a like H steel truss as a floor um, joist uh, as an option and now we're looking into go taking it the next step into uh, wall analysis um, typically a lot of this work is done um, before we get to the um, like H steel design phase so we'll know in a lot of projects already what gauges need to go in go where and um, how they need to be applied throughout the project so we're able to very quickly set those in uh, user settings essentially and uh, have the, um, the 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 panel automatically created uh, in Revit. Nick? Yeah, I think Brandon covered that pretty well. Um, one of the things we do, because we're again further down the chain and we work all over the world, is we develop the section properties for the sections that we have. So we have some whole engineering data. Um, in the US, we've worked with um, it's ICC, I think, off the top of my head to get all those bits of data certified. So then they can go to an engineer who can use certified data to actually then develop out the building structure. Uh, we don't get too involved in the structural engineering ourselves because it varies by state to state and city to city and definitely country to country. So we try to provide enough data that whoever's local on the ground can use that data to develop what they have to. Awesome. 
So the next question is for Amr. So the question is about um, the learning curve. So what was the learning curve to adopt Structsoft into your workflow and, and how like into your workflow? And can you talk to a, a little bit about your process in doing that? So learning curve wise, uh, as a construction management and the virtual design construction team, we have is it's all about accumulation of knowledge. So basically, about uh, Brandon touched upon Revit earlier. So it's an accumulation of knowledge. So we've been working with one of the very first companies to use mixed reality. We use 3D Studio Max for 4D animations, for example. We use Revit data, and then with all this accumulated knowledge it was actually easier to uh, addition for us to utilize Structsoft to communicate with the whole machinery to get that. So it's an accumulation of, uh, of knowledge uh, for years to build these skill sets uh, so we can reach this point where we can work very well with Structsoft, which is amazing and very intuitive to use and utilize all these Revit data because Revit has really information rich data that could later be embedded into the BIM workflow. So that's learning wise. Um, it, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think this, this last one I would like to take to Stephanie. So the question is about um, kind of how the relationships have formed across these companies. I'm wondering if you could speak to that part of it, of, of how the technology centers have, have supported those connections in the network to be able to create some of these partnerships um, and get this project off the ground. I think, it, I think these kinds of relationships happen in all sorts of ways. Um, I think that some of the relationships happen very organically just from the uh, technology centers procuring equipment and reaching out, asking for quotes, doing like, research. And often these companies are like, who are you? What are you doing? This is, this is crazy and we wanna hear more. Um, and then sometimes companies you know, reach out to us as far as um, you know, we've heard of you, we're interested in getting involved. It kind of happens both from the bottom up and from the top down, I would say. Um, but it usually comes from, I would say, the, the projects that we're coming in, the kind of the trends that we're seeing. So for example, if we're seeing a lot of additive manufacturing projects, then we begin to reach out to more, you know, people who are um, manufacturing extruders. If we're seeing this kind of CNC technology, we reach out to them. So it's, it's, what, what's incredible is that we have a very wide net of residents that are kind of, um, I like the, the the signal scanning, are sending us signals, and then we kind of use that as leads to, to kind of gleam um, insights and outsights of of where industries are are heading. Well, that's great. That that um, seems like a great place to close for say um, we're out of time. So I'd like to turn it back to Sophia, our host, to give us a few closing thoughts. Thank you everyone for joining us today and especially to our panelists. This was a really great conversation and I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys continue to do together um, and continue to change our world. So please stay tuned for our next outsights. Uh, they happen about quarterly and we will see you at the next one. Thanks everyone. Thank you.